The pot business is booming, and as more states legalize the recreational use of cannabis, opportunities for entrepreneurship and employment come with it. New York, in particular, is setting a pretty high standard, implementing a program that gives black and brown communities marginalized by the war on drugs a chance to put themselves at the helm of this budding industry. In tonight's Prime Focus, our Mona Koser Abdi meets with industry leaders and trailblazers to learn more about the pot equity movement and why it's been a long time coming. Inside this former Duane Reed is a first of its kind for New York City, a black owned legal cannabis shop. In the heart of Bleecker Street, Smacked Village opened its doors in January, owned by entrepreneur Roland Connor. The born and raised New Yorker is blazing trails. His dispensary is also the first black owned cannabis shop in the city. Does the pressure come from being the first black man to get this license? Oh, absolutely, because there is an expectation to succeed and there's another expectation to fail. I'm going to succeed and, at, at, you know, and make this work. Roland is on the forefront of this sanctioned industry, awarded by the state of New York with a conditional adult use retail dispensaries license, also known as a card. But this is not Roland's first foray into the cannabis business. As a teen in the 90s, Roland was imprisoned for a cannabis charge at the height of the so-called war on drugs. That now makes him the first person with a previous legal conviction to legally open up shop. It, it, it was surreal because a lot of time you try to hide your past, especially when it's negative, right? And so now I have to share it. Your past sometimes haunts you. You know, you can go, go to jail, do your time, and still, there's a stigma. After New York legalized recreational marijuana in March 2021, the Office of Cannabis Management was soon after established. And just one year later, in the spring of 2022, Mayor Adams announced New York City's goals for an equitable market and created the Cannabis Equity Program. Those who apply for a card must have previous convictions, be involved with justice, have qualified business experience, or have been impacted by the war on drugs. 30% of licenses need to be within this criteria. Card is intended to focus on those who have been directly impacted. So their justice involved, a previous cannabis arrest and conviction, and if not themselves, a spouse or a parent or a child. East Brooklyn native Dashita Dawson experienced firsthand how the drug war afflicted New York neighborhoods like hers. The former Fortune 500 executive was appointed under Mayor Adams as the founding director of Cannabis NYC, the first role of its kind. And we are here to demonstrate what excellence looks like, grounded in equity and education. From reefer madness of the 1930s and 1940s, all the way to uh, 1970s Controlled Substances Act and the war on drugs in the 80s and the 90s, we've been taught to fear and demonize cannabis. And it's our job to kind of explain how they were propagated and pushed onto the communities and that we do need to undo that. I think of people like Roland Connor as like the ultimate hustlers because when something like that happens in your life, especially in New York, it could ruin your life. And instead he said it was not going to ruin his life. He overcame that. A great example of how a card is supposed to work. For Roland, Smack Village is a family affair. He works with his wife and his son Darius his family, his inspiration to open up the shop. What is that like working like side by side? I feel blessed, but at the same time or whatever, I know this means something to a lot of men who look like me and those who don't even look like me. The relationship between father and son and what that really means where you can work with your son or, you know, still guide him. Because a lot of times we lose our kids. They're like balloons and then they get caught in the wind and they're gone. I'm fortunate enough to have a dad who's concerned about my future and wants me to go about it the right way. And I actually made me proud of him that he even took that initiative to do that for me. Exactly one mile away is another pivotal face of the program, Arena Hankin Biggers, president and co-founder of Union Square Travel Agency. She partnered with the Doe Fund as a way to pay it forward. The nonprofit organization supports formerly incarcerated men and individuals experiencing homelessness. We were lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to connect with the Doe Fund very early on, even before the application was released, because we knew that we wanted to give a percentage of our profits to a not-for-profit that serves populations that have been negatively impacted by the war on drugs. And the Doe Fund ended up becoming our co-applicant. 
So they are actually the majority owner of this dispensary, and 51% of all profits are redirected to the great work that they do. There are still over 40,000 people in prison, primarily black and Latino men, for cannabis charges. Um, you know, there are instances and stories of individuals who had like a dime bag and who were arrested and thrown in jail for seven years. New York State is one of 22 that legalized recreational cannabis and one of 13 states that implemented social equity programs. But what sets New York apart is its framework, legislation that directly benefits those with past convictions. We've been talking about the opportunity to take what was a tool of systemic um, racism in some ways um, being implemented in communities like East New York and use it now as a tool for reparative and restorative uh, justice and um, further opportunity for those communities. Other states are ahead in that they already had the policy, but 90% of them, 99% of them, purposely left out the people that were previously harmed. They purposely left out if you had a conviction, you could not actually be on an application. And just by virtue of the fact that we are prioritizing that group, we are setting a standard, not just in the United States, but globally. And that's where I think New York can really be a pioneer. What is it like for New York to implement an equity program that benefits people that were sometimes on the losing end of the war on drugs, people who would not otherwise be able to be in the forefront of this. There's really smart people who were in positions of power and understood the dynamics of New York, understood the dynamics of what was happening around the country, and um, they really thought about this. Now, it's not perfect, because there's a lot of naysayers out there, but it's, it's definitely something that's workable. As the legalization of cannabis takes the New York market by storm, the crackdown of illegal smoke shops has heightened under Mayor Adams. Just in New York City, there's about 1,500 unlicensed shops selling unregulated cannabis flower and products. The feedback from community members is that most times the owners are not from those communities. But inside, we're seeing what we call the triple threat of things being sold without a license license, illegal cigarettes, illegal nicotine vapes, illegal cannabis products. We work very closely in a task force and interagency work group with the Sheriff's Department, uh, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, um, all of the other enforcement agencies that normally would govern and oversee this. We're not trying to recreate War on Drugs 2.0 in our effort. Enforcement this time around has to be grounded in education and equity. For many, the safety and regulation of legal dispensaries such as Smacked Village and Union Square Travel Agency provides a level of comfort knowing that all product is tested, produced, and cultivated in New York State. They say their customers range from recreational users to people looking to treat health issues such as chronic pain, side effects of chemotherapy, epilepsy, post-traumatic stress disorder, and insomnia. They have inherent medicinal properties, um, and so that never goes away. As an adult, 21 and over, you have the right to use cannabis however you want to use it, whether that's nutritionally, um, spiritually, medicinally, or recreationally. And as Roland and Arena build their business, they employ those with the same passions to rise with them. It shows that, you know, we're growing as a nation. Cannabis being this thing that I feel like has bonded us and so now as it's legalized and decriminalized it makes me feel like we'll have better relationships just socially through different socioeconomic groups and um, less criminalization you know. I just hope all the work that we're doing all together as a, like an industry gets us to the point where it's legalized federally and that there's no point for any like people on the streets or like going to jail for things like this. So like I hope that we can get to that point together. And I think we're doing important work here, here in New York. Roland's journey with cannabis has come full circle from going to prison for a cannabis charge to becoming a businessman within the fold of New York's emerging industry. I haven't worked since 2008. You know, I've been an entrepreneur since then, and it's just something about being able to be my own man. Made a lot of mistakes now, you know, but um, being able to correct those mistakes and move forward and be here right now, I feel strong, I feel powerful. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.